Hi everybody, I'm Christian and welcome to Lazy Devs. Welcome to our tutorial on how to make a roguelike. Um, look at our game. That looks like a legit, legit uh, RPG. I love it. You can like break vase and everything. But if you play this a little bit, it, it it's, it's a bit like... It's a bit like, um, it doesn't seem as lively. It seems a bit uh, a bit muted. And that's because we don't have any sound effects. So, um, <laughs> funny enough, like when I coded this uh, previously and when I coded my prototype, I waited for a long time with the sound effects because like, oh no, there's more important things. There's more important things. So even I make the same mistake that I try to like hammer down with my students. When you're making a game, like the feel of the game is very important. That's kind of like the thing that drives a lot of your motivation and that also kind of like makes you, you know, that should uh, motivate a lot of your decisions when you when you design decisions. So you should have the sound effects in as soon as you can. Don't make the same mistakes I do. Teach, learn from, from the wisdom. <laughs> from the wisdom that I eventually <laughs> arrive at after making a lot of mistakes. Um, now this is going to be the part that I don't like about this tutorial where I'm not going to actually try to come up with the, um, with the sound effects on stream. Um, I'm going to actually copy the sound effects uh, because I know how they were at work. I will actually do the sound effects at the end um, just because I know that my, uh, my sound guy, my, uh, my composer Sebastian, uh, he actually already created a bunch of music that I'm not going to actually create here on the stream. And so it's going to be easier for me to merge those two projects if I put my sound effects in the very same slots that I have them in my original prototype. So we are going to have to click through here until we arrive at uh, sound number 63. Uh, something you can do always is you can press uh, control and click and that will allow you to go through this quicker. So this is going to be the very last sound effect. And for sound effects generally, again, we already had this before, you want to slow down, uh, you want to reduce the speed down to one because that's going to be, that's going to be a, um, that's going to be like a very, you know, the sound is going to be played very fast. And then I'm going to have to figure out, you know, like it's kind of looked roughly like this, I think. It's kind of looked like that. So this is going to be the walking sound. I think we need a walking sound. Let me see if the pitch is correct. Oh, I got it correctly. Good. So we get a walking sound. Now, next sound is going to be... Um, so this is going to be a, um, a door opening sound. And uh, the thing is like something that, that uh, I think a trap to fall into with Pico 8 is trying to make like realistic sounds. You can't make realistic sounds. You, what are you talking about? This is Pico 8. You, you, your, you know, your instruments are very limited. That's not what I wanted. But you, what you can do is like, so it's kind of like good to embrace like the, the gamey, the 8-bit kind of nature of it and try to do something like fantasy sounds that kind of like sound nice. That sounds nice. This is good. And later on at the end of the episode, I will tweet them. So they're exactly the same sounds that I, that I had. Okay, so this is going to be the sound that should be played when you open up a door. Now, the next sound is going to be um, the sound when you, when you like open a chest and there's an item inside. And for this sound, I went like down and then way up for like, da -da -da, like you know, for something like, yes, we got something really good one. I mean, not like really like music, like a jingle, but you know, just like so it kind of feels more positive, so it feels more cheerful. Uh, that's generally what you might be doing. Like when you have like uh, lower notes, that's generally like you know bad things happen, and higher notes are like good things happen. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, something like this, you know, it's like blink, and then the menu pops up, and you see like kind of like what kind of item you get. So next sound is um, we're going to make a sound like this, but we're not going to use it just yet. There's going to be something for later on. I want to have like a sound that is kind of like you picked up an object, but it's bad. Something is bad. You interact with something and something went bad. Something like this. <laughs> I always love this. I make the same mistake over and over again. Or it's like, map, you know. Um, and this is going to be a sound effect for, for example, when you want to open up a chest and 
you realize that the game realizes that you don't have the envy inventory space to interact with the chest. We're also going to use this uh, sound when you sometimes there's going to be enemies hidden in vases. All right, this idea that we're going to hit enemies in vases, 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 and then for this kind of like uh, situation, we're going to have like a warning sound where it's going to make you go, wait, wait, what happened? Now this is my favorite sound. This is going to be oh, I I'm not I don't know I just I, you know I come up with those sounds by just noodling around. But now I want, this time I'm not gonna make the same mistake. Uh, I want to have like a sound that is about breaking a vase. And they, they came up, this came out great. Let me try to recreate this. All right, so this is it. Um, by the way, what I'm doing here is actually makes really no sense. Like if you want to copy sounds from one file to another, you can just open up the PQ8 file in a text editor. And when you scroll all the way down, there are, all the sounds will be like a row of numbers. And you can just copy the row of numbers from one file to another. It's it's just like the process is like very intransparent like when I do it on a video. And so I just, just for you, I just recreated it in actually in PQ8. Look here, listen to the sound. I love this sound so much. That's why I really wanted to like really copy exactly the, the sound because it's um, I'm down with that sound. Okay, so the next sounds I have some more sounds in here, but they are kind of about combat and stuff like that. So you know that's something that uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about later on. Good. So now I want to add these sounds to my game. So I want to have like the 59 sound for opening ve vases, vases, vases. So let's do that right now. So we're gonna go here in gameplay now. I I told you how I you want to kind of like keep um, things uh, separated from each other. So this vast thing might not be the the best um, place. The, the this trick bump might not be the place uh, best place for sound effects. But on the other hand, there is not much to the sound effects. There is just like you play the sound effect. So I'm not gonna like stress about you know I'm not gonna have like a sound effect manager and stuff like that. We just like just play a sound effect. Sometimes you're overthinking stuff, you know. So it's gonna be SFX 59, right, for the vase. Now for the chest, we're gonna have like this item sound. Here's later on, it's gonna, there's gonna be code that interacts with our inventory. And so we're gonna play different sound effects depending on you know what the interaction resulted in. And also the vases will have different sound effects um, depending on if there's something inside or not. But again, that's something that's, 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 something that's come, comes later. Um, where is it? Yeah, that was like the openings. No, that was the opening sound for, for chests. Now the opening sound for doors. That was this, I think. Yeah, 62. And one last thing, I want actually, if I if I make a move, I want to make a move sound. So we're gonna go 63 for the for the move sound. And again, this part here is a bit bad because you kind of like um, this is stuff that um, is about about moving the player, like gameplay stuff, not really about animation. So maybe we're gonna move it out in its own function. Especially later on, we're gonna rewrite this function so it can we can actually use the same animation, the same function maybe also for moving uh, our enemies. So we're gonna ch change a lot of th things about this. But for now, I'm enjoying this. But now, here comes the part that I love the most. Yeah, oh, it's so, it's so, it's so good. Perfect. Okay, now that was the fun stuff. So, <clears throat> now to a bit more of a serious matter. Um, do you remember in the last episode we had like this, this buffer function where we were able to move um, to two things at the same time? I want this time around to fix this a little bit, to, to tweak this a little bit, because look at this. In update game, we have like this if statement, if, if but is me, we minus one and do something. And in if b turn, we have the same if statement. That's two if statements. Um, so it might be worthwhile to, like you're doing the same thing in those things. These are the same things. Why, why don't we uh, change this into a, um, a function? Something like this, right? Buff but. A function that buffers the butt. Oh, actually, butt buff is already the name of our function. Let's go just buffer buff or do butt buff.
There was a bit of a like a do pat puff, do pat pat puff. <laughs> uh, but we're gonna keep it around. It's fine. So now like this this part is like its own little function. Um, and here I noticed like we don't actually have to check if it's greater than zero because we check if it's smaller than zero. So actually we want we can just like me make sure we can just remove this and go like if but is smaller than four. Just just making things a bit cleaner. Still works perfectly well. Oh yes, let me let me smash those va vases one more time. Yes, so delicious. Oh, good. Okay, so now on to greater, more important things. So we uh, are arrived at a, at a position where we start actually have to, have to think about more systems. So this is um, a stone tablet that we created here. And what I want to be doing here is if, if I um, read the stone tablet, I'm gonna show some text on the screen. But alas, where are we going to set uh, show the text on the screen? Um, so usually in games like this, like Zelda or something, you, you get a box that pops up and then some, there's some text inside. Um, but again, this is Pico 8, just, I don't have the t-shirt on today, but uh, there's just 8,192 tokens left, uh, or we only have 8,192 tokens. So um, it's a good idea to think about how to make, you know, systems that you can use for different things. And in this case, it would be nice to come up with a system that allows us to um, create all sorts of boxes, all sorts of boxes. Um, because later on we maybe have gonna have like a UI, like a menu system, right? And that's gonna be a box with some text in it. And maybe we're gonna have like a display of your life. And that's gonna be like a little box with a little you know number in it. So we're gonna have like all sorts of boxes appear on the screen. It's a good idea, I think, to come up with a system that allows us to make boxes appear on a screen with some text in it. And we're gonna have to like a like a we're gonna have a function when you bump into this thing. We're gonna have function. Function is like show box. This is the text that you are gonna show in this box. Um, so yeah, let's do that. We have to come up with some kind of name. Uh, I'm gonna call call this wind. Uh, and it's kind of like maybe confusing, but what I mean is like an abbreviation for window. So we're gonna create like a array, empty array at the beginning. And that's just gonna be an array that is responsible here. This array will include a lot of objects that will be our windows. And then it's gonna be somewhere, somewhere a draw function. Uh, we're just gonna draw all of the windows, right? And then I'm gonna create a new tab and this tab is gonna be UI, maybe UI and juice. So maybe we can put like the animations in here. I'm not sure. We don't have too many tabs left, so we have to think about this a little bit. Let's 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 keep it to UI first. And so here we're going to go a func. We're going to call a function, and that function will just um, we're going to think about you know how we're going to interact with the system. And I think like a very imp simple interaction is going to show this window. Just show this window and and put this text on the screen. So we're going to call add wind. And now we're gonna have to think about what kind of information do we want to have about windows. I think X and Y is a very good idea. You know, where, where on a screen should this window appear? We want to have a width and a height. And here comes a bit of problem, like a bit of an issue I have with PQ8. We're gonna talk about it in a second. And then maybe you wanna have like a text that this window gets. Like, um, like what kind of text in this window should have. Now here's a bit of an important deal that, that's, uh, is I think important. So we are gonna have text in those windows, but we want to actually have those windows to be able to show multiple rows of text. And we're gonna actually have come up, we're gonna have to come up with a system um, that we can use um, that we can like easily like lay out text. Lay out text. Would in, in that I mean with that is we want to use the system also for menus where you can like have like a cursor and the cursor goes like through different options and maybe some of the options are kind of like moved around a little bit. So it's kind of like maybe indented a little bit or maybe like moved further down because this is a bit of a different thing. So it might be worthwhile to think about how to make the system flexible so we can use, for, for, use it for multiple things, but also make sure that we not overburden this. We're not gonna like have to like create our own XML programming. <laughs> Uh, or, or CSS programming thing. 
Um, I'm gonna do something real quick, uh, real easy here. Um, this function is gonna be really easy. It's gonna I'm gonna take just all the all the data that we received and it will plug it into its own object. So we're gonna create a new object. Um, I think we did this part already in a breakout tutorial, so I'm not gonna like explain how objects work because again, this is gonna be something that you should be familiar with by now. Um, and if you're not familiar by, by, with this, so maybe I will show a link right now, but I'm not sure if I am gonna be, um, how close I will be reviewing this video. Okay, so um, we just create a huge object that um, that has lots of properties, X, Y, W, and so forth. And we just, in those properties, we're just gonna take, we're gonna grab those, um, maybe to make it not too confusing, we can actually make this these uh, arguments underscore. So <clears throat> we're not confusing the properties of the object with the arguments that we received from above. And also maybe to just to make it a bit more readable, we're gonna we're gonna make a we're gonna write it out like this. Now here's something I don't, don't like about Pico 8. I don't like about Pico 8. I'm gonna be hypercritical right now. I don't like how rectangles are being drawn on the screen. <laughs> so do you know the rect function? You know how it says like x1, x2, uh, y2, y1, like the left uh, top left edge of um, top left corner of the rectangle, and then it has x2, y2, it, the bottom left, um, uh, the bottom right corner of the of the rectangle. That's bad. I don't like this. It should be width and height. It, that's how it should work. I'm not sure why um, uh, why Zep decided to make it x1 y1 and it's it doesn't make sense to me like if i draw a rectangle usually each stays the same size and is being moved around so width and height don't really change that much and by having to redefine both like moving both points um if i want to move a rectangle that makes it like, really annoying and add, you know adds a lot of token load so I actually often write a little tool function that kind of like wraps the rect, rect function into a function that works the way i want it to work and that's something that we're going to do right now but before that we're going to add our window to the window system to this window array and then we're going to do something interesting we're going to return this window object because um n not only there's going to be like an array for us for to for the draw function just plop all of the full of all, all of the windows on the screen but also we want to actually keep track of some of those windows some of the windows will be just like a message and it will you know disappear by its own but some of the windows will be like a menu and then we want to actually maybe store that menu in a variable so we can always address it so we can like move things around with that object change that object a little bit so that's why we want to also return this object here now you might be arguing that this is, might be this is a bit of a superfluous function because it just like takes all of the stuff and dumps it in an object, mm, and I would maybe agree with you. I'm not sure if it's actually saving us any tokens here, but yeah, let's see about that. Okay, so now comes the part where I will copy actually some code, because this is a function that I use every now and then. It's just really like the same thing. Here. Rectfill 2, I called it. Christian's Rectfill. And that accepts X, Y, width, and height in a color. And it just basically draws a rectangle, uh, but it takes care of the lower right corner of the, wait a minute, lower right corner. Is that is that correct? No. Is it correct? No, it's not. Yes, it is. Of the lower right corner of the rectangle. It just take, it calculates the lower right corner, depending on the width and height of the box. The minus one is necessary. Um, it's necessary. <laughs> I'm not gonna go into this. Okay, so now what the only thing that is left to do for us, actually there's just one left thing left to do, and that's gonna be drawing the actual windows. Drawing the windows. We're gonna call this draw dr, dr, draw wind. This should be double double W, but I like to remove the double draw wind. That's gonna draw all of the windows, not just one window, but all of the windows. That's because we actually not gonna have a situation where we're redrawing one window. It's only all just gonna be put all of those goddamn windows on the screen. I shouldn't be. I should be. I should keep this um, family friendly. So now we're gonna do a loop that I not used a lot in the, didn't use a lot in the, the breakout tutorial, but I kind of like start using it more because it's uh, saves some tokens. It's a four in all loop that basically just loops through an array. And 
loops through all of the elements in an array and um, for every element you know it saves that element in the in the variable w and you can now access each element in an array by just like addressing this with w so now like whatever we do with w here will apply to all of the elements in an array it's the same thing as if we had like a for i equals zero to or actually one to <clears throat> hashtag wind do and then be like okay local w equal, equals wind i so this and this are equivalent. This is the same thing, but you can see this is a bit more compact. You don't, we didn't have to create like this extra part here. When are you using one over the other? Um, there is two reasons to prefer the the for if uh, the 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 for uh, the i solution, and that is going to be one if your array is um, not starting at one. <laughs> and that's something that took me. That would be painfully a long amount to figure out. If you have an array that starts with zero or something, like a weird array or an array that has like spaces in between, then this solution will be better because then you can really control where you're starting with your with your loop. But if your array is like a standard, you know, very vanilla kind of array, then this is better um, because it uses a lot less tokens. The second moment where you might want to still use this i solution is where you actually, when the index actually matters. So, for example, when you are, I don't know, when you're looping through a menu and, you know, you want to highlight certain items and you want to, like, maybe save that, the index of the menu entry somewhere, um, then that you probably want to be using this, this loop. Um, there is a for in all with like a second variable that also gets the, but that doesn't actually save any tokens, so you can just as well use this one. Anyway, so we're looping through all of the windows and we're drawing each window here now. So this is going to be a bit of an issue. We have to, we're going to actually use a rect fill function, um, rect fill to. Now something that is that is worth worth. So let me let me just draw it real quick and then we're going to discuss this a little bit. Um, I'm actually trying to. I'm, I'm actually using. I'm actually copying this function from a different thing, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna um, discuss in a second why I do so. So we could do something like this. We draw a black rectangle. Uh, that's because we um, like visually we're gonna have like a stagger and like we're gonna go from the outside going in and we go at first we're gonna do like a black outline then we're gonna draw a frame then inside we're gonna draw another black outline for the in for the content of the thing and then we're gonna start going through the through the text because the text is gonna be an array of multiple lines that appear in our box and we're gonna start drawing each text by one one after another now here's something that we have to uh, we have to acknowledge we have to remember every time we use a dot look at the token count every time we use a dot we're losing tokens. Every dot is a token. Mind you, like the entire, f the, the entire thing is already worth a token. Like if we remove the wh, that's also a token. But, but if you're addressing a property of an object, that also costs a token. So it's often when you're addressing the same properties of the same object over and over again, you can save actually some tokens if you go go the extra length and go like, okay, we're going to actually create some um, um, we're going to create some local variables that store the values of those tokens uh, of those properties. So we don't have to always use this dot um, and. And so that's something I'm going to do here. We're going to start the height of the window and the width of the window. Actually, it's weird that we're using the width and height first in its own their own variables. So later on, when we're drawing stuff, we don't actually have to um, we don't have to um, use the dot. So we can just go like w x w y w w and w height. Something like this. Okay. Uh, right now, I'm getting nervous. We uh, we. Put down a lot of code. I don't see anything yet, and maybe all of this is broken. So let me let me do a real, t real a small little test here, whereby just drawing something on a screen. We're going to use our function here called add wind, uh, and we're going to put it down at in the middle of the screen, 64, 64, and then it's going to be like like uh, 48 width and like 16 height. 
something like this. It's going to be like in the middle to the to the right, uh, in the middle to the right. <laughs> so let's see if that that doesn't work, that won't work yet, because we're not actually drawing them anywhere. So we're going to go and take the draw wind function, and something now we're going to do something weird. We're going to put it in the our actual real draw function in the real draw function, not in our the function that is being like not like in our draw game function in the real draw function. And there's a good reason for this. I'm doing this because um, we want this system to be effective everywhere in the game. Because we might have like a menu or something like this, you know, or like a game over screen. And for those things, I also I always want to have this the system will be working. And if I really want those windows to disappear, I can just like go like wind equals open close curly brackets, right? So that's actually not something that is optional that I have to like define in every R draw function specifically. I always want this to have, to be there. And also, if you think about it, I always want the windows to appear on top of everything else. I never want to be something that on top of the windows, except it's maybe it's another window. So that's fine to just put them like behind the draw function or behind the game draw function or like, like the modal draw function in the actual draw function. Long time, long speech. Okay, so um, it's working. Um, you might not see that it's working because it was like this black thing, but it's, it, it does actually work. But it's kind of like weird. Uh -huh, I, see, I see the problem. We mixed width and height. I'm going to make it red so we can see it. Ah, there it is. So we now have like a little box appearing. <clears throat> I'm gonna make it dark blue, so it's, it's it's visible, but we're gonna turn it back later on to, to a normal color. Okay, so now we have a dark blue box. Now, this is not gonna be an efficient way of doing this, but I kind of like this. So we, now we're gonna go like one, one smaller, and we're gonna create the outline. So it's gonna be uh, min plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one, uh, minus two actually. Now. Uh, and that's gonna be uh, this light gray color, right? Is that how I did, made it last time around? Yeah, it's gonna be light gray color. So that's gonna be like the outline. And we can now create the actual content of the box. I could use the, um, not the rect fill, but just the normal rect function here. And yeah, I just couldn't use it. I, I'm not sure if we're actually gonna to save tokens because I'm actually using this rect fill two function that is that does a better job of calculating the, um, the, the second, coordinate of the of our um, of our box so mm, I'm not sure if I'm actually saving uh, saving talks like this but you know that's that's how I roll and if you have better suggestions of doing putting this off let me know I will definitely listen okay um, real, real, real little fix here so now we could have created like a little box here okay all that's left to do is we want to actually write some text in this box and so we actually they created a box, but we didn't, didn't actually put any text in here. So I'm gonna put some text. Now I could just write down, hello world, right? So I'm like, put, just give this text, uh, this, this box a bunch of text and just display the text. The problem with hello world, which is like a, like a string as something that the box knows, is that I don't really have a good control over how many lines I have. And maybe some lines should like have like special, like indentation and stuff like that. So I think that's a good idea in this, in this moment to actually give this box an, an array of lines. So we can define exactly what ha what appears in what, li what line. So we go hello world and this is line two. So now like we can like give a text box like an array of strings and a text box will like display one string after another. So what we want to be doing now is we want to loop through our text string and we want to start displaying each line after another in the box. Now there's a bit of a, bit of a problem here. Um, first of all, we're actually going to use, we're going to loop uh, with the i loop, not with the 4w and all, but with the i loop. Why are we doing this? Well, because this is a situation where we actually want to know the index of the text that we are, we want to know which line we are in for later shenanigans where we might have a cursor and we want to be you know, displaying a cursor at a given line and therefore we want to know which line we are currently drawing so we can draw that cursor next to it. So, so that's why you have to actually know the index of this thing. And again, there's like a different way of doing this, but I kind of like these kind of, these kind of loops. 
Okay, so we're just gonna go through it and then, um, I mean, we're just gonna print this. Uh, we actually may, might save it. So we're gonna go local t equals um, wtxt just so we don't, don't have to like always, uh, this is this is like the worst case scenario where, you know, you have a dot that costs a token and then you have the square brackets that costs a lot of tokens, you know? So, uh, you know, look at this, just like this little, little bugger here, it costs us, um, four tokens for just like a statement that could be also a variable. So we kind of like want to save the four tokens whenever we can. So we're going to save the text of this line in a little variable called t, uh, txt. Let's, let's save it in a txt variable because t is already a different variable that we use for something else. We're going to print this. Now, where are we going to print this? So we could do something like wx divided by the row of which, which we are printing, but I think it makes, sen makes sense. It's kind of like um, a, bit, a bit nicer. If we have like a running, you know, this is the, like a running a variable that, that keeps track of which line we are currently in. So we're gonna, we actually have this the wx and w, wy variable here. So we're gonna actually use it. So it's gonna be wx, um, something like this. It's going to be x coordinates and it's going to be y coordinates. And then when we're drawing this, we're going to just go like, okay, just draw it in the wx, wy position. And then after we printed it, we're just going to add six to wy. That's going to be like we jump to the next line uh, because uh, a line of text is six pixels high in Pico 8 using this font. And then we need a color, let's just go with six for now. We're gonna maybe later on, later on have a situation where we can different colors. Now let's run this real quick. Mm, okay, so you see the text is appearing. There is a bit of an issue and then that issue comes uh, over and over again in Pico 8. So we put down some stuff, but you can see the box is too small. So we could now, okay, always make sure that, you know, the boxes are always big enough to contain the text so the text never overflows. But it would be nice if we had like a system that makes sure that even if the text is too big, that it kind of like stays contained within the box because this looks ugly. So there is, a, and that's gonna be the final thing we're gonna to do today. There is a function p that allows us to contain uh, any draw functions, sprites, text, whatever, in an area of the screen. You might not know about it. It's called clip. We're gonna clip the drawing area to a certain area. And it's gonna be wx, wy, now ww, that's the width, minus four, and w height, mm, no, not minus four, minus eight is what I had last round. And w height minus eight. How do I write with those numbers? Trial and error. <laughs> it's, there's, it's no magic. Sometimes you have to like do, 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 do the um, grunt work. So yeah, now we have like a little text box that's kind of contained here and it's cut off not exactly at the edge because I always want to have a bit of a margin around the text. Okay, so we have now a little system and now we can like ma uh, manipulate this. We can put it somewhere else. We can, um, let's make it a bit higher now because we realized, okay, we have too little, not, not enough space. 56, maybe something like this. So yeah, this is line two. I want to save two. So maybe we need to, maybe it has to be 64 after all. Let's, let's, yeah, this line two, that's good. And then 24. Now this has been a very long episode, I noticed. Okay, so we have now a system that allows us to draw text boxes and then let us remove the the blue color because our text boxes will stick to the monochrome to the monochrome color scheme that we that we derived. So far, so good. So now uh, the only thing that's left to do is I want this box, I want a message box to appear when I actually interact with the stone there, with the stone tablet. But you know, this, this episode is running kind of like uh, very long already. And there's maybe some other things that we want to be doing here at this moment as well, because for example, we might want this box to disappear automatically, or we want to have a system where you can press a button and the box disappears. So there's actually a lot of more work um, required to, to create like a system that's kind of like really working on its own that you don't have to like uh, manipulate. So I'm gonna ma make a small break here and we're gonna continue in the next episode. If you have any questions so far, uh, let me know in the comment sections as always. Um, and of course, uh, the code of the episode of this, um, this program at the end of the episode will always be in doubly do downstairs. And I remind you that you can join our Discord to check out the full prototype of this game. See you next time around guys, bye bye.